Hello and welcome to the Global Church Project. I'm Graham Hill. Fernando Segovia was the first president of the Society of Biblical Literature from the Global South. He travels worldwide teaching on non-Western theologies and especially theologies from Latin America and the Caribbean. He also unpacks the shape of minority Christian theologies in the West and especially from Hispanic Americans. As a cultural critic, his interests include post-colonial and minority and diaspora studies. Fernando Segovia has edited many academic journals. He lectures internationally and he's the past president of the Academy of Catholic Hispanic Theologians in the United States. Fernando Segovia, welcome to the Global Church Project. Thank you. It's a pleasure and an honor. You're the first president of the Society of Biblical Literature from the Global South. How is that a marker of the tectonic shifts that have happened today? And what has that meant for the role? Well, um, I began in the society in, in the 70s, late 70s. I think my first meeting was probably 1976, 1977. Mm. And uh, there were very few people there from mm. outside of the North Atlantic uh, area. And certainly very few, maybe a handful of racial and ethnic mm. uh, minorities. So it was a very different society uh, at the time. In the next decade, actually probably in the 80s, maybe even later than that, there were two movements uh, or two, two developments that took place. One was the formation of a program unit. First, a com I think first there was a committee and then it developed into a program unit. By that I mean a recurring slot mm -hmm. in the program, which was called the Bible in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. Mm -hmm. And it drew uh, people not only from, uh, from Europe and the United States, but also it, it drew the few people that were beginning to attend from the other continents. We were few, but I think mm. that, was, uh, that was, that certainly represented a marker mm. uh, for the society. Mm. And at the same time, I think it was, I think it was late 80s, and then at the beginning of the 90s, and it may have been 1991 itself, there was a committee created uh, a committee on underrepresented minorities in the profession, which brought together uh, African Americans, Asian Americans, mm. and Latino Americans to plan for the future, to assess the present and plan for the future of the society. Mm. And I, uh, I'm, I, I do believe it was 1991 because I think the 25th anniversary yeah. is coming up next, yeah. uh, next year, which would be 2000. Mm. Uh, 16. So those are really big markers mm. for a society that was very much, uh, and for understandable reasons, very mm. much European and American, or shall we say North um, Atlantic. Mm. And since those early developments, I think the, the move, um, the, the number of people, both from outside mm. Europe and the United States, um, when I say United States, I should also mention Canada. Mm. So let's say from the global south uh, has increased more mm. and more so. And also the number of racial and ethnic minorities mm. to the point where you now have um, um, program units, not just mm. on the Bible in Africa, Asia, and Latin mm. America, but the, in, in Africa, in Asia, mm. in Latin America, mm. among Latino, uh, mm. Latina, Americans. In other words, there has been a proliferation of these um, uh, program units, there has there has been a multiplication of the number of people uh, who attend from these particular quarters, and so today it's a, I think it's a very different uh, society than than it was before, and and I think much much for the better mm. altogether. Mm. So there's been a shift in the way that criticism is understood and approached in the Western context. But there's also been the influence of, a, of global conversations, of yes. uh, the ways in which majority world and diaspora immigrant groups yes. are engaging the text and also their social political realities. How do you see the diaspora and majority world communities engaging in biblical criticism in fresh ways 
that is informing the way in which we do criticism today? Mm -hmm. I, uh, to my mind, and I'm coming to this rather late in my life, mm. but, um, but um, I've always received from my Christian tradition, <laughs> and from my parents in particular, <laughs> that one must fight yeah. uh, for peace and justice <laughs> until the end of one's life. And I believe that uh, it is our duty, at least some of us, mm. to, uh, to, uh, to address these crises, such as, again, climate, migration, and they are already being addressed, um, economic inequality, yeah. um, and, and you can multiply these uh, several times, but that one must address, uh, address these with mm. utmost care. And by that I mean, first of all, one must become acquainted with the body of work that is being mm. produced now mm. on uh, climate change since the 1960s or 70s, mm. on, um, on the policies of uh, globalization, especially mm. that, uh, along uh, neoliberal lines that followed uh, mm. upon the demise of, of, the, of the socialist model. In, uh, in the late 80s and, and beginning 90s, uh, the new types of migrations, international migrations mm. that are taking place mm. throughout the world as a result of these changes mm. uh, uh, as well, and see what, what these texts and, and the interpretations of these texts have to say about such crisis. Because there is mm. inequality in the Bible, mm. it reflects that. Uh, there are things about climate in mm. the Bible and the ecology. There are things about migration in mm. the Bible, about race and ethnicity. And I think these texts and the way mm. that they have been interpreted uh, should be uh, called upon, mm. investigated, called upon and used to address mm. uh, uh, these crises. Mm. And if you have a document and a tradition of interpretation that is so full of these things to begin with, why not employ them, employ mm. them um, to this purpose? So and, and here what I found was mm. that in, in other fields like uh, literary studies or historiographical mm. studies, there is a call precisely to do this mm. at this point, that historians and critics should actually take these things into account mm. as, 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 as we go mm. forward. So I say, and, mm. uh, and why not us? Mm. Why not us? Especially given, I believe, the gravity mm. uh, of the moment. And, and I've, I've only spoken of the individual fields of study, climate studies and so forth, but also mm. the whole, the conception of the global system. Mm. What does this imply? Mm. Uh, how do we get a handle on it? And, um, and how does this particular body of work envision previous global systems going mm. back to antiquity? Mm. Can we put all of this mm. uh, to work with the future mm. uh, in mind? My goal is not, I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm mm. in my declining years. I hope they are slow ones. Um, but at least I want to be able to, to, to theorize or to contemplate Mm. how this could be done mm. so that others can improve mm. upon it. Uh, you say when, when thinkers and theologians from the Global South are engaging in biblical criticism and theolo theology in general, that they tend to approach it with a broader worldview, that they're more acutely aware, I think, of diversity, yes. the diversity in the yes. world. How do you see that? What examples of that do you see? And what influence is that having on the way in which we do criticism today? Well, I, I believe that in a way what, what, what such critics do is to, uh, to explode the myth of, um, of scientific knowledge for all, mm. as brought by the West. This mm. science is pure knowledge, and it's to be imbibed uh, by everybody for the benefit of everybody and the development of everybody. And I think what you find in, 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 uh, in many uh, parts, if not everywhere, outside the global north, is a sense that not all of these policies and not all of these visions 
have actually served to improve the mm. lives of others. These are mm. critics that, that are acquainted mm. with and, and work with um, and work in mm. very difficult conditions. Mm. On, let's say on the other side of mm. what um, uh, the, the, the policies of science mm. or the visions of perfect knowledge for all uh, who see the destruction, see the other side of what these visions entail and have entailed, and want to introduce these particular factors, these particular situations into uh, the equation mm. and into the very conception of knowledge itself. Mm. That these are worth taking into account, that there are other ways of explaining mm and addressing what development is, uh, what, uh, uh, what uh, riches and poverty are and should be, mm. and so forth. Mm. So that if the voices of others, especially those who are on the other side or on the mm. underside yeah. of these policies are taken into account, perhaps mm. we can devise different, different models of knowledge. Mm that will have um, other goals in mind, such as mm. peace and justice. When you look at biblical criticism interpretation today and you think about who are the dominant voices and how do they engage in the pro their projects, do you still think it's the case that biblical criticism is captured by a kind of white cultural captivity? Do you think it's still the case that those from the underside, those from the global south, are still underrepresented and that the conversations are still framed by Western paradigms and imaginations? Yes, I believe that that, that, that uh, that's sort of marginalisation still mm. takes place. And it takes place not just in terms of, uh, of numbers, but it takes place also in terms of discourse. There are certain things that are still mm. considered proper and mm. appropriate uh, to do in doctoral training mm. and then in, in one's career. And there are certain things that are considered not as proper, not as appropriate, as things that um, such scholars and critics do and that mm. it is good for them to do so perhaps if, if there's kindness in, mm. in, if there's an amount of, uh, of kindness in that evaluation without realizing that everything that they are doing also pertains uh, to you mm. uh, and to everybody that we're mm. all in this um, together that mm. knowledge is more than one mm. that uh, opinion is more than one that voices and mm. faces are um, are, 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 are extremely diverse and that knowledge itself is, mm. is more than one mm. and that I think one has um, mm. uh, a duty to, uh, to be aware of these other knowledges and discourses mm. and contexts mm. and a duty to engage mm. in, criti in critical dialogue mm. uh, with such knowledges and mm. uh, such persons and such visions. Mm. And that's what I think, that's what any field of study should be doing anyway, mm. to be as broadly uh, represented as possible. That doesn't mean you don't make judgments or mm. make critical judgments, mm. but you do all the time. Mm. But what it does mean is that it, it, you do leave your, the, the safety of your traditional confines, whatever mm. they may be, and, uh, and try to see what else is being written about. Mm. And so I begin to think about how um, myopia or hegemony uh, is affecting the way in which we engage in biblical criticism while being critical of alternative proposals yes. and at the same time listening to voices that have traditionally been marginalised or silenced. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you think that kind of... Are there ways that we can navigate a way forward Exactly. There. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. And, and it's, all, it's not just a question within criticism itself, but it's also a question of dialogue between this field of study and what other fields of yes. study are doing. Yeah. 
because even if you are, let's say, if you belong to the more established traditional mm. way of doing things, mm. and you don't realize that the fields that you're appealing to, mm. let it, maybe literary criticism or mm. historical s criticism, historical mm. studies, mm. are already doing this kind of, of mm. approach, this kind of uh, research, then mm. you yourself mm. as, are, are not being true um, to your own field of study and, mm. and to your own quarter, let's say, mm. within that field of studies. Mm. Because things are moving in many directions, in many fields of study at mm. this point. Mm. And, and, and in many ways, uh, the sense of diversity, the sense of uh, impending crises mm. is, is taking hold and is moving, not only moving the fields, but moving the fields also towards a call for greater cooperation among them. Mm. That climate change is, for example, not going to be addressed simply by climate change mm. uh, studies, that it has to be addressed by mm. economic studies, geopolitical studies, mm. all sorts of studies that come together and, 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 uh, and analyze this crisis from any number of perspectives. Mm. My position is that there is no reason why the religious theological discourse mm. Uh, should not be represented mm. and indeed at the forefront mm. of, of such conversations mm. and, and, and such concerns. Mm. Thank you for joining us at the Global Church oh, Project. Thank you. Thank you very thank much. You. It's been a pleasure <laughs> and an honor. Thank you. And a delight. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. You've just watched an abridged version of this interview. For the full interview, plus resources for churches and colleges and universities, please visit www.theglobalchurchproject.com. I look forward to your company next time. From me, goodbye.